We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. We're, we're at a really key phase in the war. So just about a week ago, um, there was reports from U.S. intelligence uh, assessments. And as we've seen right prior to the invasion, U.S. intelligence assessments tend, have shown themselves to have a pretty good track record recently, saying that Ukraine had about six weeks for more offensive actions. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, we're joined by Eurasia analyst Matthew Orr, who works for RAIN, Risk Assistance Network and Exchange. On this episode, we discuss Russia's war in Ukraine, and we take a look at what to expect this winter from a military and political perspective, and we also take a look at Putin and his motivations. I hope you find this episode informative. Thank you for listening. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for joining me today. So, um, first of all, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Rain? Sure. Uh, my name is Matthew Orr. Uh, I've been working at Rain for about two years now. Uh, I'm a Eurasia analyst, so I cover basically all the former Soviet Union, excluding the Baltic states. But you know, yeah. I, I do plenty of stuff related to, to, to them as well. And yeah, so I follow political, economic, all geopolitical developments in the region, field questions about those developments from clients, uh, and of course, write for our uh, commercial website, um, which which is known as Stratfor. Um, but you can find all of our, our analysis where, at, at rain or rain, rainnetwork.com. Excellent, excellent. So what drew your interest in sort of Russia and Eastern Europe? Yeah, I was really interested in the transition of society from one ideology to another. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always fascinated about how people uh, of the, the older generation could grow up, be trained in a certain ideology, and then watch that entire ideology fall apart in front of their eyes, um, see, you know, see the difficulties that they went through in the 1990s, um, where they, a, a lot of Russians felt that uh, basically, they had been kind of abandoned by the West. On the one hand, the West was trying to invite them in, but um, because the the standard of living collapsed so much in, yeah. in Russia, there was a lot of biz- bitterness and anger that grew. Um, and then, of course, we we saw what that what that led the rise of, which is Vladimir Putin and his ideology, and the way that it had to slowly and slowly reveal itself. Because if it had re- if it if Putin's ambitions and dreams and what he really saw for Russia had been revealed kind of at the time, it probably would not have been politically popular. And I don't think Yeltsin would have uh, named him as a successor, but that's kind of getting ahead of the head of the question. But yeah, and then I I was trying to understand how kind of how that led to the the developments we were already seeing, because I started studying, getting really interested in Russia um, a couple years prior to to the annexation of Crimea. And even even before then, I was I, I, I actually showed up for Russia uh, after having taken Russian for some time at, at university um, and, and showed up there right after the annexation. And it was just a fascinating time to be there because it was this time where, you know, a lot of people were starting to in Russia for the first time were asking themselves about, huh, well, what, what is kind of our, what is Russia's destiny? What's our role in this? Um, the economic situation that had been improving in Russia for, for many years on the back of high oil and gas prices was now kind of changing. Um, and, I was there when the the ruble had its first collapse from about thirty two rubles to a dollar to something like eighty uh, in a matter of yeah. weeks. So the, I was witness to a lot of these incidents where 
Russians would go to, and to, to try to get their hands on hard assets to uh, to, to try before their their currency depreciated and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, all of all of that and my experiences there after having gone for the first time really got me un- in qu- interested in this question of of ideology. And I think that the point that really you kind of put an exclamation point on it is when I I studied abroad at a Russian university, the political science department. And there I met students who were, you know, brilliant students. This was a top five university in Russia. And th- they could, you know, wax about Aristotle or mm-hmm. uh, certain things they had been learning about, about political philosophy at, at the university. But then when I would ask them, you know, a simple question about civics, like, well, well for example, who's your representative at the Russian State Duma? A lot of these very, you know, educated Russians, young Russians, usually we, we see a lot of these youth uh, at, at universities as politically engaged or, or at least wanting to be, but even they didn't know basics about the Russian political system. And that's when it really kind of, the, the light bulb started going off, that this is really about civics and ideology and a failure to, to sincerely, uh, effectively train people uh, in, in, in Russia's new ideology in line with its yeah. constitution, etc. Yeah. Interesting you mentioned that about the failure of civics, because I kind of feel in Western society, we're kind of going a little bit through that because there's a lot of young people who are very, and older people, two people of my generation, who are very politically active, but then they can't answer who their local MP is, and they don't really understand how certain things do and don't work, and it leads to sort of frustration and things. Yeah, and and I, and I think it's I think it's a it's a global thing. So if it's a problem, you know, in our societies where presumably we even still have these institutions and mechanisms that are supposed to to bring that. Imagine in a country where none of this was ever really set up or, or taken seriously. Mm. Um, and so it, it's really not surprising that 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 this is where we ended up. Yeah. Was there anything else that you saw there whilst you're in Russia that kind of later sort of played out with Russia's invasion of Ukraine? I, I think the other thing that comes to mind is of course the the the, the T V propaganda mm. and what it's like to be in this other information uh environment. I mean I remember when, when I was there for the first time in 2014, it's when a, a lot of that, uh, 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 what's the word, graphic, nationalist rhetoric, violent rhetoric had really started to enter the propaganda mainstream for the first time. Um, and at the time, you know, we, we thought this was shocking. We thought, you know, as, as a Western, I immediately kind of felt the, how this was similar to, to fascism and, you know, classic examples of propaganda that we would have learned about. Uh, but in in Russia, it didn't seem to be striking people in that way necessarily. Mm. And then what happened is, of course, over the over the years since, uh, a lot of us got kind of got we we became complacent about it and kind of think, well, there's no there's no real repercussions of of this propaganda because I mean, look, they've been saying these things for years, but that doesn't mean that you know Russia is going to invade Ukraine or that you know X Y or Z is going to happen. Um, but then, you know, as, as we've seen recently, the, the, the propaganda actually does have an effect. And there, there was a, a long time kind of infor- informational preparation for, for, for the invasion that I think that for a lot of even analysts and experts, we kind of begin to, to dismiss. There was actually an old joke in Russian that, um, you, you know, um, you know, what, what will the vegetables have tonight? Well, the vegetables will have red meat. The vegetables is referring to kind of older Russians, kind of more um, uh, homebodies in Russia who just became used to <laughs> used to having their dose of this kind of nationalist red meat um, a- a- every night. Um, and yeah, that's certainly another thing that struck me. The other thing I would probably add here is just the 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 presence of uh, Soviet iconogra- iconography and images are still up all over the country, which was really astounding to me, again, related to this ideology question, because I would have thought that, you know, or if you go to Eastern Europe, of course, they had lustration and they took down these monuments and they, et cetera, et cetera, or they put them in museums. In Russia, there was there was there was no illustration of the of the officials of the of the, of the regime, and then if we talk about monuments and iconography, there was just a little bit. But I mean, you'll you'll go to town square, and you know, there's the hammer and sickle up everywhere you see. All the streets are named Lenin. All of the communist revolutionaries, for the most part, still have their names up um, all over the country, and that does have an effect, right? Because it, it you if you're a child, for example, and you're going to the Lenin Mausoleum or, or whatever it may be. You're still saying, well, hi, 
on the one hand, we're, we're supposed to have a totally different ideology, but on the other hand, we're still <laughs> everywhere celebrating the yeah. the figures of this ideology that we we claim to have disavowed. So I, I think that's another kind of piece of this ideological contradiction that is having that helps explain and understand what what you're seeing in Russia. Yeah. Do you think? Um... Because obviously there's people prior to Putin, Yeltsin, but do you think Putin sort of um, purposely sort of played into that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a famous kind of, um, I, it's not really confirmed, but there's a famous anecdote about how Yeltsin uh, prepared the documents and the institutions to and had uh, the, the order essentially ready for Putin to remove the Lenin mausoleum and have Lenin buried. Um, but, but so grows the kind of apocryphal telling of the story Putin re- rejected that plan, even though Yeltsin had started preparing it for him. Um, so yeah, I mean, Putin did, did start leaning into all that, right? Mm. He most famously, Yeltsin started to change that he had a coal commission set up and they uh, wrote a new Russian national anthem, different uh, tune, different lyrics. Um, and uh, there, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, there's a British uh, uh, documentarian named Adam Curtis. I don't mm. know if you've heard mm. of him, yes. but he actually had a, r- a really good piece come out on Russia recently that I definitely recommend to all of your listeners. And there he does a very good job of actually showing the work of this Russian uh, National Anthem Committee in conditions where Russia is in economic chaos and collapsing and the, the writers are you know struggling because they're, they're, tr- they're trying to you know ex- ex- extort these high ideals at a time when around them they're seeing a lot of degradation. Um, and then, of course, Putin Putin reversed that as well. He took back the Soviet tune and just ch- changed the lyrics to have it referred to, to Russia, right? So, yeah, Putin has really leaned into kind of preserving, and a lot of his ideology is yeah. actually based off of the, the continuity through the Soviet era, uh, specifically this idea of the countries related to the, to, to the title of the name of this podcast, right? The the continuity of the the country's security services as being the real source of statehood for Russia, and yes. that's the only thread that really ties all three of these entities: Tsarist Russia, Soviet Russia, current Russia. It's the only thing that really unites them. Mm. And Putin, being a true KGB man, you can understand why he he went for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. So, um, can you give us some background on then on why Russia invaded Ukraine? Sure. I I, I think that the I mean, there's obviously you know, it's like we're going to be talking about this for a long time, right? Mm. People ask like, why did the Soviet Union collapse? And there's like a whole scatter shop. Of reasons, right? It's that, it's that the the ideology, you know, Gore, the real, the main reason, in my opinion, is that Gorbachev um, did not. He realized that the ideology needed an updating, and it was the ideas in his head about democracy and what real democracy looks like, because democracy had already always been celebrated. But uh, and so he wanted to realize that. But there was also the economic issues, the you know, Af- war in Afghanistan, uh, culture, rock, etc. But it's it's going to be the same way with this invasion of Ukraine. There's going to be a lot of theories about you know, or debates, if you will, about what really caused this. Um, my opinion about what really caused this is it's a lar- it's largely related to kind of geoeconomics and the the, the mm. Russians Russian elites' perceptions mm. of what Ukraine leaving the Russia's kind of geoeconomic sphere would mean for Russia itself, the political calculation. So what do I mean by that? I mean that Ukraine was the second biggest economy within the, the Soviet Union of the, the Soviet republics. Uh, Ukraine had been Russia's one of Russia's top, top three trading partners at the time that Putin came to power, and there had always been those economic links. Of course, Ukraine post-2014 was moving, or particularly after 2014, was moving away from Russia's sphere of influence. It was integrating with the EU. Uh, you know, the European values were spreading. Uh, the, the Basically, the, the what was the slogan in Ukraine? It was, we, we just want Ukraine to be a, a normal European country, as they would say, right? They can't, you know, get their corruption levels at least up to, you know, Romania, right? <laughs> And pretty basic, mm. realistic mm. goals that I think are pretty, you know, rational for mm. the Ukrainians, right? Um, and what the, the problem with that for Russia is a that Ukraine totally leaving their their sphere of influence as a result of those processes would make Russia's kind of uh, current integration less attractive, right? Because then you would have Belarus sitting there going, "Well, hold on, wouldn't we? Shouldn't we do the same thing? I mean, we we should probably also reorient." And then you would also have the caucuses saying, "Well, hold on, we, I mean." The, the European project and, and, the, and the, the, the economic benefits of being tied to the West are so high. 
and then all of, and then it would go all the way to, all the way to Kazakhstan, and we're still seeing that today, where these entities are saying, "Well, hold on, it's more profitable for us to be economically integrated with the West and to have support those connections than to hamstring our trade by being in a customs union uh, w- with Russia and you know folding to Russian re- regulations and rules, etc." And then, of course, the, the the cherry on the cake is, of course, that uh, what happens if, an, if if people come to power in Ukraine saying, we just want to be a normal European country and it works out for them, then you have all those people in Russia going, oh, we just want to be a normal European country and it would it, it would it could potentially work out for us. And so that's why we saw the, the repressions of Navalny and his organization, the, the, the crackdown on big tech and free press um, within the country. And, and all of that, it was basically this use of this geopolitical standoff with NATO in the West as an excuse to, you know, right, push back against these political forces that 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 Putin thought were, you know, a danger to to his regime, his friends, family, his his kind of entire governing network, and of course, even at the end of the day, the the FSB and the and the the security service. Yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty. I mean, I, yeah, I find that idea that um, if like Ukraine, as you're saying, becomes a successful. European country and Russians are going to turn around and sort of turn on their leadership and say, hey, what's gone wrong here? I think that's a real big fear, isn't it? I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it, it was and, and that's that's kind of why they had to do this sooner rather than later, which is that, you know, Putin's popularity was 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 falling before this. Um, the the everything was kind of stagnant. Mm. The, the country's economy was was already stagnating and poor. So they needed this entire paradigm shift domestically to really set a new normal and say all of this political speech that you know for decades Navalny uh his views liberal views in Russia broadly in Russia were, were totally normal right but now an entirely new bar of repression has to be set to stop to stop those ideas from becoming more popular yeah yeah indeed so prior to the war did you did you think Putin would invade Ukraine Really interesting question. Of course, we I remember the the months really leading up to the invasion so clearly, um, and because it was it was just such an emotionally charged time. I remember writing my first piece about the renewed buildup in the very first week of November when CIA Director Burns went to Moscow, and we wrote about that on our site immediately because it was immediately clear that 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 something is this buildup is is very serious. And so we, we, you know, we warned people about this possibility immediately. Uh, then once we got to December, as this late December, as this was continuing, we kept coming back to the same question, which is that, well, there, there are really two problems here. A, uh, they don't, the, the Russians could not accumulate the amount of forces needed to achieve what they were threatening, right? I mean, you couldn't, so they were threatened, they were essentially threatening Kiev, they were threatening northern ukraine uh, and and clearly talking about re- regime change uh that's what they were threatening but they didn't have enough forces to do that so um uh, you know on on the uh, we that that's what that's that was always what our analysis was kind of hung up on is well how is how are they going to accomplish this thing if they clearly don't have the forces to do it um so i mean that's kind of the the main reason that's that's one of the main reasons that we 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 kept kind of thinking well hold on mm-hmm. maybe this is not going to be a full scale invasion maybe it's to threaten that in the negotiation hope that the negotiation with the west <laughs> gets uh, su- su- uh sufficient concessions and putin's comments after the invasion literally the day after when he spoke to the the oligarchs high ranking business people he said he said something like i i mean you know, i i was stunned i i, I really thought that they would they, that they were going to that they were going to cave, that they were going to give me these concessions, um, uh, or that, or that instead of doing this this so called full scale invasion, that they would regroup their forces, concentrate more on the Donbas, concentrate more on southern Ukraine, um, try to encircle the Donbas, and kind of the grand irony is that basically, if if, the, if Russia had done that, it would have been way they probably would control all of the Donbas right now, but precisely because they threatened. And then attempted this more grand scale invasion with political in- interplay, try to encircle Kiev. That's actually obstructed the achievement of their much more limit, min- minimalist, limited goals, right? Yeah. Securing Donbass, etc. Um, so I, I know I, I really, I really didn't think it, it was going ha- gonna happen because I. Oh, and the second reason is that it's, it's we, we also knew that it would be a strategic disaster for, for Russia. 
Um, the, 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 the big data point that just came out on this today is that the, the International Energy Agency said that Russia's energy exports will never reach ever reach the volumes that they were at the pre-war level. Uh, and by 2030, the overall amount could fall something like 50% in terms of volume. And mm. the, the revenue would not fall that much, but it would also fall. So it was like, you know, if, if Russia is going to blow a hole in the biggest source of its state revenues, and that's going to be a permanent reduction that it can't replace. I mean, and then you, you add on all the other factors, the, the civil aviation, the uh, d- just the, 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 the investment climate, climate being so poor, it would just seem like for, from an economic standpoint that this would not be a strategic success for, for, for Russia. Uh, so those were the two main reasons, right? The military impossibility of it and the, the strategic blunder that it, that it almost certainly will wind up being. So we, we didn't think it was likely, likely. Yeah, yeah. I remember in the build-up, there was this sort of sense that once sort of Russia went in, that they would kind of walk over the Ukrainian army. Um, yep. And even I bought a little bit into that. I was thinking that Ukraine might last days, but, you know, yeah. bless them, yeah. they're still going. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I think that, that that whole topic, right, Kiev's going to fall in three mm. days, is mm. such an interesting little kind of microcosm of a lot of things. Yeah. Um, I have to admit that I, right, precisely because I did not think the invasion would, would happen for those two reasons, I, in the within those three days, I begin to think, huh, Putin must be so sure in his confidence of the political interplay needed to remove Zelensky and install some pro-Ukrainian leadership, even though we, I knew it was patently impossible on its face. I was like, the fact that he would go through this must make, he must be so sure that that mm. element of this is going to work. Mm. Um, so even I had that moment of doubt where I was like, well, maybe, but I didn't think militarily that they, they would collapse. I knew that they would stick up for the fight for their homeland, stick up for their independence. And I think there, there's uh, an American professor, Timothy Schneider, is actually giving the, this, this Yale course on uh, Ukrainian history right now. And the, in, in the first lecture, the, the central idea is that um, the, the reason that narratives like Ukraine will fall in three days is precisely because we, we don't know, you, people in general don't know Ukrainian history. Mm. Um, and, you know, I remember even over the holidays before the invasion, you know, I would have, uh, you know, p- parents of relatives and people like that saying, well, huh, Ukraine, isn't that part of Russia <laughs> or, or things like that? And there, there was always kind of this, this, un, this, this throwing in of Ukraine um, with, with Russia in terms of its identity and uh, uh, things like that. Um, and I think that that's actually the sort, the kind of the almost subconscious, unconscious source for a lot of that thinking is that we were never taught Ukrainian history like we were taught, I don't know, French or or, or British history, but there's enough there to to tell the story. It's, it has a similar national story to all the other countries of Europe. And so th- that's what, how I also kind of think mm-hmm. it's interesting to think about that question of, of why, do, why the three days fall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I remember... I was very guilty of kept calling Ukraine the Ukraine, and it, and it was just this habit. And I, I don't honestly know exactly where I picked it up from, but it's sort of that thinking of it being a former Soviet state and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the reason for that is so in in Russian you say na Ukraine, yeah. so you use a different preposition to refer to it. Then of course when that came through German and eventually English, it, it led to this this grammatical thing where they started referring to Ukraine as a territory, just mm. as the, as a, not as a, as a, its own political state, but just like a, you think of like a flat area. It's just a, it's just a thing as an object essentially. And that's kind of the origin of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was very guilty of that. And when all this happened, I slowly, well, no, not so quite quickly realized my error and uh, did my best to correct that. So obviously the war has been sort of going on for some time now. Are you able to kind of give us a quick update on on the war it's where we're at now and any key points that you've sort of observed recently? Yeah, we're we're at a really key phase in the war. So just about a week ago, um, there was reports from U.S. intelligence uh, assessments. And as we've seen right prior to the invasion, U.S. intelligence assessments tend have shown themselves to have a pretty good track record recently saying that Ukraine had about six weeks for more offensive actions in Ukraine. Uh, there was essentially, I think, three or four reasons for that. The main reason is that the weather is going to change. Uh, the season is going to change in Ukraine, right? So uh, it's going to become a lot cloudier. And when it's cloudier, that's going to obstruct satellite imagery need that's so critical for the Ukrainians. They're targeting with the HIMARS, the, the precision systems, etc. Um, their intelligence gathering of Russian forces. Related to that, you're going to have more rain. Of course, the rain, it's the famous uh, Rasputitsa 
right? Uh, the, the rainy season that obstructed uh, Nazi Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union um, and things like that. So it's going to make it a lot more difficult for all kinds of vehicles to move across uh, sub- southern Ukraine and these, these muddy areas. Uh, the other reason is that the foliage is, is already falling off the trees. So a lot of these uh, defensive positions that are dug under right the, the trees are now going to be exposed. And that's going to lead to this highly kind of chaotic phase where these previously secure positions are now visible and the, the armies are going to reposition relatedly. Uh, and then finally, of course, you're going to have uh, hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers mo- mobilizing who in the coming weeks are, are going to be breaching the front. And so that's, that's going to make it a lot harder for Ukraine to advance. Um, so it's that's kind of the, the, the short answer is that the Ukrainians still have this short period to continue advancing. Uh, and they're going to keep doing that up, up in the Luhansk region, possibly in the Zaporizhia region. They're going to continue to hold in, a, in the Donetsk region, but that's also where Russia is going to con- continue concentrating. Um, and then, of course, the most interesting part of the front is everything related to Kherson, um, the, the city on the Dnieper River, that southern uh, uh, bridgehead that the Russians have uh, on, on the western, or as the Ukrainians called it, the right bank of the river. Um, and w- our kind of view on that is that the Russians are pouring in resources to hold that bridgehead. Um but it's it's interesting why they're doing that because it's simultaneously they they can continue to hold it if they just keep pouring in enough resources, but in the long term it's 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 not the best place for them to be funneling in these resources. It's so the supplying the area is so is so difficult because of crossing the river on these barges that are constantly getting destroyed. And so I mean, on the one hand, the Ukrainians probably can't take it back quickly. But on the other hand, it's uh, it's my assessment that it's an indefensible position for the Russians in the long term because the, the, of the supply difficulties. So I, I think we can comfortably say that the Ukrainians will retake it eventually. Um, we, we just don't know if that's going to be within a month or, you know, potentially in, in many months or years. But I mean, after that, uh, the, the war is going to become uh, this this more slow grinding pace uh, is my assessment. Russia is going to threaten more offensives yeah. including through belarus to, to renew the threat to yeah, Kiev from yeah. the north but uh because in putin's mind um putin thinks that huh the, the ukrainians he he's kind of alluded to this logic publicly he said the, the ukrainians were so close you know in in late march to to striking a deal with us but then but then they but then they left negotiations after we withdrew from kiev and northern ukraine so in Putin's mind, Putin has said, oh, the reason they left is because we removed the threat to their capital. And so I think he's very attracted to this idea that if we can just return the threat to all of Ukraine again, then we can bring them back. And that's, all, that's also what the, these rocket attacks all across Ukraine, which are having a big effect, destroying power stations, infrastructure. It's about keeping the, 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 the threat to all of Ukraine and making the country unlivable, right? And that's also related to the, what we talked about earlier of how Putin wants to make Ukraine into a just a, a, a destroyed country to, 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 to show other countries in its geoeconomic orbit that this is what happens to you if you oppose us. And, uh, uh, d- you know, d- domestically to, to signal how their resolve to, mm-hmm. to, to, to do this. I have a morbid question. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I, I feel ashamed of myself for even thinking this, but um, I am, I'm sort of slightly surprised, but again, this is me, not a military expert, that Russia hasn't chosen to try and take out Zelensky in any proper way. I, I mean, obviously, earlier yeah. in the war, there was talk of hit squads and things like that, but um, surely Putin just needs to fire rockets, doesn't he? Um, I don't know. It's, it's well, horrible. Yeah, yeah no, so I, I think, I mean, it's been reported a lot, and I think we can safely assume that within the initial weeks of the invasion, there was an, an order, an attempt mm. to kill or capture Zelensky. Mm. Um, that, that seems pretty plausible to me. Um, just because, right, that that was probably what was needed as part as part of their crazy uh, political interplay plan, part of the invasion. But I, I mean, for, to me, the the main constraint on that is pretty clear, which is that if Russia is assassinating Zelensky, then they're opening the door for forty million Ukrainians to assassinate Putin, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And assassinating Putin would have an equally detrimental effect on, on Russia, its political stability, its future, and so that that that's potentially an escalatory path that Russia does actually not want to take take this down. The the security services of Ukraine have, have demonstrated an ability to operate within Russia to uh, as we, as we saw with the the 
the things related to the mm-hmm. the presumed assassination of uh, Alexander Dugan's uh, daughter, the attempt on to assassinate him, presumably. But it, but also, you may remember in the opening months there was a lot of um, reports of sabotage at major Russian research centers, uh, manufacturing plants. I think it's we can presume that possibly some of that was related to the security services uh, of Ukraine. And so, I mean, the Ukrainians speak Russian. They can live in Russia. They can be undercover in Russia. Yeah. And it's it would definitely be dangerous for, for Putin to to assassinate Zelensky for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really hope he doesn't because, uh, yeah, Zelensky's become a sort of Churchillian figure. I mean, he's, he's probably yeah. the most inspirational politician I've ever seen in my lifetime, yeah. to be quite honest. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's mm. that's such a fascinating element of this because I I um I I learned Ukrainian a, in in graduate school and then actually lived there for for almost a full summer, um right around the time of Zelensky's election oh, and wow. I I yeah. covered Zelensky's uh, uh rise very very closely with a group of students and we we held focus groups with Ukrainians about what they thought about Zelensky and he was so fascinating through his use of social media to kind of you know went over the, the youth vote and then he of, of course won the election in a landslide mm. i at that time was very skeptical of him because i saw him as part of a trend that i didn't like of these i mean he's a former comedian um yeah, who who was a, a tv producer essentially and i was very i thought he was a an, an instrument of the oligarch kolomoisky uh, who was his main benefactor, mm, who mm. Zelensky had worked for his entire life, produced content for Kolomoisky's TV channels, etc. And there was very clear that um, uh, that 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 was a deep relationship, and I, I was very concerned about that. And I just didn't think that Zelensky was competent in matters of, of state, uh, as opposed to the the former president Petro Poroshenko. And so I I I, I saw Zelensky as kind of this populist um, kind of social media president figure that I was very kind of alarmed by. Mm-hmm. You know, particularly mm-hmm. following the, the the rise of of Donald Trump and what that had done to the United States, and of course even you know Brexit and and think you know how that had kind of really divided that country. And I was worried about potential di- the divide within Ukraine that that he would cause and his competence. Um, but then I what I've re- what I only really realized after the invasion is that he has been such a, an effective communicator in a way that uh, you know a, a conditional Petro Poroshenko or, or somebody of his type would not have been and would not have been able to the, unite the country as much as Zelensky has. And yeah, a lot of that is due to his his professionalism in front of the camera his ability to deliver lines with 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 such eloquence and and accuracy accuracy his comfort public speaking i remember his very first speech his very first speech after the start of the evasion it was just it was just fantastic it was just emotional he hit every little uh, emotional cue of it Mm, and mm. and that's what rallied the country united the country um of course his his background as as a russian speaker also really um, kind of helped integrate a lot of these these areas in Ukraine that had been feeling felt kind of disaffected by, uh, you know, by the 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 the. It's a, it's a long story that we don't have to get into, but he he was good at u- uniting those people, mm. and so I, I've realized now that he has, as as you said, he's in, he's been extremely effective not only within Ukraine but abroad at kind of. Uh, taking the, the Ukrainian message there and, and being an effective communicator. Yeah, I, I hope one day I can have a chat with him. I'd love to find <laughs> out about his um, guiding philosophy. It's not something I'd go into now because obviously I wouldn't want Putin to listen and say, oh, that's how he's thinking. But but um, I'd love to know what his inspirations were because um, in a weird way, because he's not that much older than me. I'm 41, so Zelensky thinks, what, 45, 47, something like that. And I'm wondering if some of the pop culture references we might share, I don't know. <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah, but you you bring up a good point, which is that um, Zelensky is you know potentially he's 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 of a well he's certainly of a let's put it this way he's certainly of a generation much entirely younger than Putin. Mm. So Putin just turned seventy. I think Zelensky's something like forty eight or, yeah, or something yeah, like that. But yeah. he th- that's the whole point, which is that he's of such a different generation, grew up in such a different information environment, and like that's why his communication resonates with with us so much more. Mm. 
No, indeed, indeed, and in fact, yeah. In the age of politicians, at the moment, a lot of politicians are a lot older. Um, there are now yeah. new exceptions to that, but yeah, that's, it's quite an interesting point. That, yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, so uh, back to our back to Putin. <laughs> um, in September, uh, President Vladimir Putin signed an accord to annex the occupied regions in Ukraine, and he vowed Russia would never give them up, and he would defend them with all means available. So, um, what is the significance of these annexations, and how? Far do you think Putin would go to kind of keep that territory he's now holding on to? Yeah, it was a great question. Um, obviously, history is being written as we speak as far as w- what these annexations are, what how Russia is going to respond, because nobody really knows. Yeah, all of the data we have so far is that Putin is before our before our eyes setting the precedent that you can re you can take annexed sovereign Russian territory with no consequences and that does not entail a nuclear strike on your country and things like that. And so the the real danger that Putin is creating in himself is that he himself has now made this precedent that you can uh, att- uh, retake these seized areas that he claims to have annexed um, with without Russia really annexing significantly other than what they're doing, the the strikes on civilian infrastructure, etc. But it doesn't, despite their claims, they're not putting these territories under Russia's nuclear doctrine. Where that's going to get dangerous is where is, for example, if the Ukrainians, I don't know, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, if the Ukrainians all of a sudden are on the doorstep of Crimea, um, and now and now they're 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 pouring into Crimea, Putin is probably going to say, "Oh my gosh, this is this is sovereign Russian territory, all this stuff," but he has. Now set this precedent. He himself doesn't seem to recognize a, a difference between Crimea and the seized territories. Mm. Ukraine has also conducted strikes on the in Crimea that Russia has not responded to in a in a specific way. So, in my estimation, it, Putin's gonna they're gonna attempt this 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 gymnastics where they're gonna say, well, no, Crimea is different, but the, the, they they've set a precedent where they've shown that it's not really different and that you can re- retake your territory. So that's the the real kind of danger here. I think. Um, I think that I think that on the other hand, Russia will fight tooth and nail to defend the so-called Crimea land bridge, the land corridor. So through Kherson and Zaporizhia regions connecting the Donbas to Crimea. I think that's kind of the backup base case scenario for Russia for Putin to sell to the Russian people that hey, we we've still got a victory. Um, and even just today, Putin still says that hey, everything's going according to plan. And then they say, well, what's the plan? And he goes, oh, well, the plan was to defend the Donbass and Crimea. So presumably he's taken those regions to def- better defend the Donbass and, and Crimea. Uh, and so I think that, that that's th- th- those areas they're going to fight tooth mm-hmm. and nail to defend mm-hmm. because losing them would then threaten Putin's own regime because it will be much harder to sell the Russian people that this was a success. So Yeah, no, indeed. How are ordinary Russians viewing this at the moment, do you think? It's hard to say because... Getting sociological data was difficult in Russia before the invasion. Now mm. it's arguably <laughs> more difficult, just fit more difficult to get, period. And then B, we're even less trustful of the answers that are given. So basically, there's only one organization in Russia called the, the Levada Center that does polling that's considered credible. And you know they, they've shown that Putin's popularity is declining since the invasion, um, the invasion itself, people, the R- Russians are extreme, especially following the mobilization. The number of Russians who say they're concerned about the f- future has mm. skyrocketed to, mm. I think, something like 70%. Mm. Um, but right now, kind of Putin's popularity is declining very slowly. I mean, we're talking about, you know, a percentage point or two each month. So it's a negative trend, but it's not very kind of sharp. Um, and then, right, the, we, 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 a lot of Russians, you know, are scared. I mean, they, they don't, they, they, they're, they tend to, you know, uh, hide their views if called up by a pollster, certainly. And then even in, in conversations with friends, I mean, they're, they're, they're scared of the return of the, of the old, um, Soviet practices of, of ratting out your neighbors to, to save yourself. Uh, and they've seen that even, uh, just today, another very recent example, uh, Ksenia Sobchak, uh, Putin's granddaughter, um, the, 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 the daughter of the man who actually gave Putin his first job after the KGB in St. Petersburg in 1992. Well, she, she's fled Russia because there, there now is a, uh, an, an attempt to 
most likely frame people associated with her with uh, um, extortion and anti-Russian activity. And we're just seeing a constant flow of people labeled as, uh, you know, uh, enemy agents. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's really hard to say. But the the bottom line is that we we have this big chunk of Russian people who are just turn themselves off from it because they don't want to think about it and it's mm. and it's scary mm. but they're not willing to actually actively oppose anything yeah it kind of reminds me of um uh Oleg Gordievsky's biography uh Oleg Gordievsky former KGB agent who defected to the west and he was an MI6 oh, yes, agent yes, yes, yeah yes. yeah and um he talked about like in Russia, a lot of people just use the crosswords and very benign things to have a conversation, just you never have a conversation about politics or about what you're actually thinking. It's always just going to be the crosswords or sport or something like that, and nothing more. Yeah, you you would only have those political conversations uh, at your home and preferably mm. at your dacha, um, out your country home, where it was considered less likely that somebody was monitoring you. And then, you know, you would have them around you know, a bottle of vodka or whatever uh, form of illicit uh, alcohol could be procured at the time. Mm. And yeah, you tried to keep these conversations um, kind of on very, you know, private settings. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Turn the music up and talk low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, can you talk to us about the Ukrainian forces victory in Kharkiv and its significance yep. to in the larger war against Russian forces? It's it's definitely significant because that first off, that offensive was a, was the one of the reasons it's successful is that it was considered somewhat surprising, I think, to the Russian forces. They were caught off guard. Everybody was saying that militarily the obvious place to counterattack would be in Kherson, where they could seize up to the river. Russian forces are more more vulnerable and poorly supplied there. And then once they had secured up to the river, they could send those forces mm-hmm. eastward. Russia started in, in reinforcing Kherson, uh, so Ukraine was kind of looking at what are our options. And there was essentially just a, a vulnerability there that the Ukrainians wanted to capitalize on. It appeared that a lot of the front was manned by these troops from the Luhansk People's Republic, so they weren't regular Russian army troops. These Luhansk people who thought that they had already liberated their their homeland territory, their region, so why are they sitting in Kharkiv region? Uh, and they're poorly equipped, etc. And and so the, the Ukrainians attacked there, and once they broke through, they uh, the, the, the 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 Russians showed that they did not want to hold these territories, right? Because Russia hadn't yet annexed Kharkiv, and so they withdrew. Most significantly, the Russians withdrew from this city called Izum, which had been kind of this uh, supply hub for them. And then the the loss of that bridgehead really reduced the the threat to all the rest of the Ukrainian Don what they the Ukrainians hold in Donbas because now there's no threat of those forces being encircled. The threat in the previous months is that all of Ukraine's best troops, their their best supplies, best troops are still in Donbas mm-hmm. where they had been mm-hmm. building fortifications and fortifying for for years, right since 2014. And the threat to them was them getting encircled in some you know major encirclement. But now that that threat is completely gone. And as far as the the main significance, um, I would probably say that it's the the Ukrainians show that they can successfully counterattack. Uh, mm-hmm. And th- there was a lot of doubt about whether Ukraine actually could counterattack. The the skeptics had said same would would say things like, "Well, Ukraine has never conducted a a, a, a successful modern offensive in in their history." Right? I mean, this is you're asking them to do something they've never done before against a a, 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 a better supplied, better equipped opponent, etc. And they they destroyed that, and they showed that you know just a few uh, Western weapons and will are able to you know overcome the, the these challenges. And so I think it's it's very significant because it shows that that this war is is going to drag on, and the Ukrainians do have significant offensive capabilities. And the, it of course was a big lift to Ukraine because they've already proved to their people that they can mm. liberate their territory yeah we've obviously talked a little bit about the winter and its sort of uh, potential bleak kind of view from a military perspective but um obviously there's a talk of in in europe we've got sort of rising energy costs uh, because of gas shortages and in certain parts of europe there is a desire to give putin at least a part of what he wants in ukraine and in, in the u.s with your midterm elections coming up we've got republicans who've expressed a desire to limit or reduce military aid to ukraine so what do you think 
the winter has ahead, um, maybe politically in store for Russia and Ukraine um, and Western support? Yeah, this is this is really the key question, because I think that in an environment where Russia can't win on the battlefield, Putin's only clear path to victory is breaking Western unity, breaking Western support, making the West supply fewer weapons and ammunition to Ukraine, because if 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 the Western support, if the, the ammunition stops flowing, then Ukraine can't counterattack. Um, so right, and and that's that's even a, a big uh, kind of a big turning point, right? The West can continue to s- supply Ukraine enough ammunition to defend itself, but if it's not going to supply enough ammunition to attack, then you know it's it's kind of the, the Ukrainians are not mo- incentivized to continue mm. attacking. They're mm. incentivized to sit back and say, okay, well, we have to accept our fate. So, right, Russia wants to even marginally begin to reduce that that Western support. Uh, basically, the idea is that, uh, right, if he can, if Putin can use energy blackmail, rising energy prices, threat of political destabilization in Europe, mass protests, uh, falling energy cutoffs, uh, then those governments will become more likely to uh, uh, stop uh, supplying, right, want to save more money at home to stop supplying Ukraine or just for political reasons preemptively say that, hey, we, we, we should have negotiations with Putin. Let's let's reduce our military uh, support. The, the way it seems to me is that um, it, it's, it's not going to work out that way. I mean, it, there's a lot of debate about whether Putin needs this to peak this winter. Like, for example, if, if, he, if, it, if this doesn't work this winter, the Europe survives this heating se- season, does that mean all of Putin's leverage is gone? Or does he seem to think that he can draw this out for three, four, five, six heating seasons and kind of keep this pressure in a, in a kind of a pressure cooker for years? Um, I mean, that, that's kind of the really difficult question. I, I, tend to, I tend to think that Putin would like to, to peak this as soon as possible. And so if that's the case, then he's more likely to engage in even more energy cutoffs, right? So they've already... Uh, blown up the the Nord Stream pipelines, um, but there, there's there's more. There, the very obvious next step for Russia would be to uh, destroy the the pipelines through Ukraine. Uh, something like forty million cubic meters a day of Russian gas are still transported through Ukraine and sold to the to the EU countries, and Ukraine gets transit fees on that gas every single day. And it's even causing uproar within Russia. They go, oh my gosh, we're at war with this country. Why are we still yeah. paying the Ukrainians to yeah. send our gas? So, I mean, it's very clear that that's the next thing that that would go. The the kind of the 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 the, the one bright spot potentially for the for Europe is that uh, Russia's flows through you through Turkey on the Turk Turk Stream pipeline. Um, those are unlikely to be cut off because who does that go to? That goes to Turkey. Serbia and Hungary, right? Three states that are have shown more of this geopolitical alignment with Putin. And if Putin cuts off their gas, then they're going, well, <laughs> well hold on, wait, wh- why are we even, you know, maintaining our kind of vague pro-Russian lines or, or, con- or continuing to talk for dialogue with Putin, right? I mean, now they've cut, off, cut us off of the one thing we presumed was our benefit of doing that. So I think that Putin is unlikely to end uh, gas, at least on that, that route. Um, but yeah, to, to sum up um, and directly answer your question, I, I don't think that um, that we are going to see protests in Europe, and it's going to get it's going to get ugly this winter. Like, let's have no mistakes about that. Bills are going to rise. Um, there's going to be protests. We're already seeing kind of a, wait, a dress rehearsal or a taste of that in Moldova. Actually, mm. uh, there's a big protest movement there, all about high energy prices, high gas prices. Wants the government to change course. And I think Putin is signaling through Moldova, hey, Germany, that this could be you, right, in, a, in, in this, this December if, if you don't change course. But I, I, just, do, I just don't think it's going to be successful. And one of the reasons why is that I think that European politicians are going to probably say that, look, if we get through this winter, that's it. You know, then we, we've already pr- reduced our, our reliance on Russian energy yeah. uh, economics, yeah. like something like se- 75%. And then they'll go, look, the, the hardest time is already over. Now, now would be the precisely the wrong time to change course because we've already, we, we, he's, we've already ridded him of his, of his leverage. And so of course it would be a mistake to backtrack only once, right? Our leverage is now higher. So 
I, I I'm skeptical that it's going to work, and I think that most of these Euro- these European govern- governments are going to make it through. Mm. One quick question popped into my head whilst you're chatting there was about Russian Turkish relations. Because am I right in thinking that Ukraine are using a lot of Turkish manufactured drones at the moment? Obviously, now Russia is using Iranian drones, which is another interesting thing. Now, I don't know if you got any thoughts on on their relations there. Oh, absolutely. This is a topic that we've been covering uh, extensively. Um, on our website. So people interested in this, I would, I would encourage to, to check out our work on this. But yes, uh, Turkey, of course, uh, has a, v- a very interesting relationship with Russia where, you know, Turkey, like any, uh, any, any, any one of these countries that, you know, claims to be a, a civilization state that has its own ideas of its sphere of influence, et cetera. Ex- of course, expanding through the whole Turkish world, through the mm. Caucasus mm. into Central Asia, Kazakhstan, even within Russia, Turkic speaking peoples, etc. You know, Turkey is going to do do things, uh, is going to play itself off in order to get the best deal, right? And so, yes, Turkey uh, is reliant on Russia for a lot of things, cheap mm. energy for a lot of things. But Ukraine, but they're 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 also extremely supportive of Ukraine, right? They're at the vanguard of not recon- recognizing Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea, for example, as you mentioned, arming Ukraine. But they want to use their position between the West and Russia to to in- do things for themselves and, and ensure their own kind of uh, stability because Turkey also used to be a major buyer of both Russian and Ukrainian agricultural products. And they want to use this whole situation to, to further Turkey's interest and in their prestige. And of course, if they can use their grain deal that they helped broker to serve as the, the base for a, a, a broader peace agreement eventually in the future, then that's that's certainly kind of something in their interests. On the other hand, the, the other the, the underlying factor is that you know, you know, t- 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 Turkey would potentially stand to benefit from Russia losing the war, right? That would mean a Russia that's more inward looking, less focused, less less able to project its influence on the mm. Caucasus and Central mm. Asia, mm. and though that those are sphere of influences that where where Turkey could very easily come in and and kind of in a from a geo economic standpoint begin to expand its influence. So. You know, Turkey and Turkey realizes that that all sides are, you know, aware of Turkey's position. And so Turkey is going to constantly kind of be this this go between between Russia and the West. Yeah, actually, think about President Turkey. Quite an interesting kind of character because he seems to look at Turkish history as, an, in a way, as an influence for the future potentially. So, do you think we might be seeing the beginnings of a new Ottoman esque empire in the works? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, neo Ottoman thinking. Absolutely. Um, I I I I'm, I recall that uh, I believe that the so basically after. Azerbaijan won the the second Nagorno-Karabakh war against Armenia in 2020. Of course, there was all these victory celebrations in Baku and Azerbaijan. And when er- Erdogan, uh, you know, attended a lot of these ceremonies, was showing his close ties with Aliyev, the uh, Azerbaijani dictator. And when he was there, I, I believe uh, during one of these military marches, they played the the marching anthem of the Ottoman Empire. Right, it's almost <laughs> like a, a not even a veiled kind of you know reference. Um, to to these kind of pan Turkic I, I, you know ideas, and yeah, he he does look upon that fondly, particularly in the context of Erdogan being a more religious figure as opposed to the the secular K- Kemalist state and, and ideas. So yeah, I mean that's what that's what this is really all about. And I should I should be and and and, and who was the biggest enemy of uh, the Ottoman Empire? It, it was Imperial Russia. It was mm. Catherine the Great. It was mm. Mm. The, the expansion of the Russian Empire. So if if Turkey is calling itself neo-Ottoman and is embracing those ideas, then Russia is the inevitable country that they're going to be in conflict with. So that that's why, you know, the, the, you keep your friends close but your enemies closer kind of thing is what's what's going on yeah. what's going on there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I can foresee future podcasts on this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, so it feels like Putin's war on Ukraine is really about him, his reputation, and his holding on to power. So how far do you think Putin is likely to go to get what he wants and to hold on to power? This is, again, you're hitting the key questions. Um, I, there's kind of two options here, right? Mm, One mm. option would be de-escalation, right? So what that looks like is Russia, you know, saying it's going to escalate, making threats to to a certain extent. But when push comes to shove, if if it's losing on the battlefield, it just retreats, uh, engages in threatening things or destructive actions that it's already engaged in, right? For example, these strikes on civilian infrastructure. 
but it just allows itself to lose on the battlefield slowly but surely, um, and then uh, eventually retreats back into it, its its territory. Um, for a long time, I didn't think that that was possible, but I, I've also re- noticed a slight change in Putin's rhetoric. Um, and there was a big forum out in uh, Vladivostok uh, several mo- or gosh, may- maybe in August or several weeks ago, and he said something to the effect of. Well, they asked him, hey, well, what, what's the biggest benefit of the, the special military operation, as it's called in Russia? And he goes, well, look, I mean, the, the biggest benefit is not even what's happening in Ukraine. It's that we've increased our sovereignty. And what Putin means by increasing our sovereignty is, you know, cutting off our uh, connections with the West, right? Repressing yeah, internal yeah. dissent voices, yeah. right? So it was almost this shift to saying that the the biggest benefits of the war are actually just internal changes that I that I mm. wanted to make but didn't have the excuse to do. Yeah. Um, and if if Putin leans into that rhetoric, that's how he would explain something like a de-escalation, right? It would be like. Hey, look, like, you know, this is unfortunate. We we wanted things to go better. But look, we've evacuated the these pro-Russian people from Ukraine. So he would still say that I've saved the, the Russians or saved the people. And then he would just use their pervasive uh propaganda apparatus and hardcore repressions to to instill that reality that this was, hey, we still benefited, we still realize these things. Um, so I, I think that that's possible. I think it's po- for if, if you would, if you asked me way back um, in like March, I would have said like no way something like that's possible. But I'm becoming increasingly, I think that it's very unlikely but possible. But unfortunately, much more likely in my estimation is the scenario where he goes for escalation. So um, the, there there are ways that he could he could escalate. Obviously, militarily, it would be. Deepening the mobilization, right? So, uh, uh, doing a full mobilization, for example, declaring war on Ukraine. Although there's a lot of mobilization steps before that, um, of course, the energy blackmail stepping that up, uh, which I think is is also quite likely. And then the re- the real one that I think you really wanted to get to is the nuclear escalation, right? The nuclear blackmail. Uh, so there are there are a lot of ways that that nuclear blackmail. Uh, could look right. The recent dirty bomb talk is just the the latest flavor at the at the ice cream store about that. And I think it's no coincidence that the dirty bomb talk uh, came simultaneously with uh, the the th- threatening movements of Russia's regular nuclear forces uh, that that Western reports had been referencing for a while. That the the Belgorod class submarine with the the nuclear tipped torpedoes had left port in the Arctic Ocean, or that we observed strange movements on Russian rail of Russian nuclear assets. We didn't get what that was about, uh, and then just uh, yeah, I guess two days ago, Russia announced told the U.S. that oh, we're actually conducting our our annual nuclear triad deterrence test. Uh, and so I think that the, the connection of the dirty bond to, to that test was about showing, look, I mean, we, we will, we will, we will you do a nuclear retaliatory or strike even on the most flimsy of grounds. Right. And that's what I think that this, this dirty bomb thing is about. It's, it's, everybody knows that it's already ridiculous, but the ridiculousness is the point. It's that, it's that it's like before the invasion, Russia was saying, well, yes, we have evidence that Ukraine's about to use chemical weapons in the Donbass, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. It, the, 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 absurdity, that, yeah. the absurdity is is precisely mm. the source mm. of the leverage and the threat because it'll, mm. it'll, it's saying even on the most flimsy grounds that the international community, even if you think our, our narrative is so flimsy, we'll still do this. And that's precisely why you should be scared. Um, so I, and I, I, I tend to think that the the line for that for Putin is going to be Crimea. Uh, he's he, I don't know how long it take. It's probably not going to happen next year. I think we're looking at a, a war that could drag on for years and years. But uh, you know, eventually, if strikes on Crimea become more common or the Ukrainian forces are are threatening Crimea, Putin is going to attempt to really ramp that nuclear stuff kind of to to level five. Um, he, he they could raise the nuclear threat level, for example. Um, they've only done that once, and the the just hours after the start of the invasion, they ra- raised the nuclear threat level from the lowest level to one level above. But there's actually two more levels they could still go to, um, and I, I think Putin is is going to try to 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 do that. It could either come this winter, at some point, if he tries to have all this leverage appear at some sort of a crescendo, maybe around January or February, 
or that the next opportunity would be to try to say, okay, Crimea is different from the rest of Ukraine, or maybe the land bridge is is now different from. But the whole thing is that he the, the, these these distinctions are arbitrary because they've already left areas that they claim to have annexed since their Russian sovereign territory. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, that does paint quite a bleak picture there. And um, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking of that. Um, I, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but there's a particular day in January that's considered the the uh, day, the biggest sort of blue day for depression and things like that. So I better keep an eye out around then, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, indeed. Well, uh, um, do you think, are we, so obviously we talk a lot about Putin. Do we think we're any closer to seeing the end of Putin? And if he does go, um, will things get any better? Yeah, I think that so when when we think about kind of Putin and, and succession, I think that at this time, basically, if the replacement for Putin at this time would be a more hardline, essentially more hawkish person. Mm-hmm. Um, the the mm-hmm. attack line, the dominant attack line on Putin at this time is that. Well, I mean, look, if if escalation is our only way to win. Why are why are we waiting to escalate? We're just gonna what? We're just gonna take a bunch of extra, lose a bunch of extra men and money mm, for mm. several more months or years, and then escalate to to to, to end the war and, and and win? Well, we shouldn't we shouldn't wait a bunch of extra. We should, if that's what it takes to win, we should do it now. Um, and we've already people have publicly kind of indicated that the head of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, had said we should use tactical nukes in Ukraine and called for you know more escalation. There's this guy Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, sometimes erroneously referred to as Putin's chef, uh, but the head of the the Wagner group um, has been kind of playing a lot of these escalatory mm. uh, things, has criticized Putin's pursuit of the war, etc. Uh, and I think that so you know, so long as the war has not been shown to be a failure within Russia, um, and so long as Putin is you know alive, it, it, there's there's really no way that Putin could be. Um, uh, replaced by 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 somebody more liberal than him, or somebody willing to 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 de- de-escalate. I don't think that there's a real threat to Putin. We have to talk about who who could possibly coup Putin. Um, the the military is way too scared and does not have enough political weight to do that. In my estimation, um, I don't think even there's there's not now we have the first time this general Surovikin who's trying to become a public figure now because he runs the whole operation, but he he he's not going to be taken seriously. Um, and then there's nobody else within the military who has the confidence that they could pull this off. So of course the the coup would have to come from the FSB. And then if you're talking about the FSB, it, it's the, it's kind of similar questions. It's like you know one of us could pull this off, but who's going to do it? I mean nobody. I mean it's way too scary to, to to attempt to organize something like this. But it's something that Russia's scared of. I just uh, I also yesterday we I'm lucky that for this interview where we've had a lot of recent news that's been perfectly illustrating the points, but. Just yesterday, there was a big, um, what they called a training exercise in Moscow around the Kremlin of a bunch of uh, riot police vehicles and military vehicles simulating like the government's reaction to some sort of coup or, or a, a, a event in the Kremlin. Mm. So there, there's these indications that potentially the, the Kremlin is preparing for something like this just in case. But I, I, I don't think that the, there's there, the, at this time that the FSB could, could, anybody within the organization could pull that off. Um, so I think that yeah, I mean, as as in general, it's it's really hard to see the Russia's political course changing. I think it's either going to be stability or even more hardline forces coming to power. The only way a liberal or a, a force for de-escalation co- could come to power, clearly for kind of de-escalation, would be if Putin dies suddenly and the operation has already been recognized as a failure within the country, right? Then you would have the conditions where, right, people would be looking for somebody to assume power not from the failed kind of establishment, but it, the, those conditions are definitely not met at this time. Yeah, and do you think? Um, I suppose like I could always think of like the end of World War One in Germany and what went mm-hmm. wrong there. So obviously, there's a lot of sanctions against Russia at the moment. Could um, could some of the sanctions be reversed as a kind of a uh, an, not an appeasement? What's the word I want? A sort of a, a a cherry on the yeah. cake, something to kind of encourage a positive change in Russia. Yeah. Yeah, just as a policy question, I think it abs- it absolutely should be. I I I do kind of wish that Western. I mean, they they've essentially said that, right? They've said that if you know Russia leaves Ukraine, then you know we can take the sanctions off. But I think that you know, especially months from now, when these mm. questions, I think, will be more 
apropos, it would be nice that if Western leaders reminded, you know, Putin or Russian leadership, hey, you know, if you if you deescalate, if you leave Ukraine, of course there's an avenue to 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 remove the sanctions. And then of course if a if a if a if a a a, a liberal government somehow some way came to power, then of course it would be imperative to remove the sanctions and help uh, Russia's improve Russia's economy and essentially correct the mistakes of, of the 1990s, where yeah. instead of a, you know a Marshall Plan for for the Soviet Union and to prevent kind of the the, the rise of this this uh, ultra nationalist essentially fascist Russia, you know it, it all all efforts need to be made to uh, help Russia economically to right to have the the, the West Russia's return to the ec- international community be seen as economically positive for mm. for Russians. Mm, mm, indeed i mean like um yeah it feels like because uh, there's a lot of russia seems to be at least with putin he seems to be very reliant on this sort of anti-western rhetoric that's been basically pumped into russia for the last sort of 20 years and i'm trying to figure out ways um one could in for the future kind of um kind of put a stop to that and that, does that mean do we need to consider getting i don't know controversially russia into the eu or, or russia into nato or some not you know something crazy like that i feel like we need some sort of um yeah left field thinking yeah going on. yeah I, th- I think we do i mean uh I, you know nato uh and the eu still have you know had their have their open door policies and i don't think that anybody in either organization is is trying to bar well, no, I should restate that. There are people who would want to mm. bar Russia mm. outright from mm. <laughs> those organizations, um, but I, I, I don't think that, that that view will prevail, and I don't think it's the right view. Uh, and I think that, yeah, the real, a real sincere prospect of kind of deeper integration of Russia into the West should be uh, offered to Russia. Or, yeah, or, and if, and if that's politically unpopular in Russia, if that has all kinds of issues, then... I mean, the, the the state of the relationship beforehand should be equally, you know, we we should make things short of that also very attractive to mm. to Russia, right? Mm. I mean, the the EU should should offer very favorable trade terms with Russia, and you know, NATO of course had an entire dialogue with Format, and if you read the 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 Russia NATO founding act um, from 1997, I believe, I mean, it's it's very clear that you know NATO. You know, it has a has a positive view towards Russia, and NATO doesn't want to threaten Russia, and NATO doesn't um, have pretensions on Russia's territorial integrity, which is notable now because, in theory, right? You, I mean, if you if you go back in history, you, you there's tons of even NATO countries that would would say that they have territorial uh, pretensions against Russia, right? Finland, Estonia come to mind. So, um, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of very obvious things that i think that the west you know could offer and should offer to integrate russia into the west um and you know i I hope that that in that scenario although i I should reiterate now at this time i don't think that this is we're thinking very many years down the road but um yeah yeah. yeah, those those things should should be on on the table just as generally i think that the and this is what a lot of russians liberals have actually said they've said one of the hardest things about our job in russia right now is that that the west is not yet all Offering an alternative to Russia, they've said that the, the West should con, should continue its current course vis-a-vis Ukraine and Russia, but simultaneously they should openly offer this is the, this is the size of the economic pa- package we would offer Russia if they right uh, forwent their their invasion of Ukraine mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. showed interest with reintegration. Right? If you put that offer hard on the table, also have it have security aspects. You could you could do a draft of the renewed Russian NATO founding act, an updated text. I think those two elements would be so key in really allowing a lot of the, the liberals in Russia who still it's not impossible that they come to power. There's German Greff and there's uh, um, Kudrin, and there are these kind of high high um, respected more liberal people with, within Russia that have not been, you know, disgraced and moved, removed from their jobs, et cetera. And so, you know, if you have a perspective like that out, I think that it would be very tra- attractive and it would be helpful for everyone. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Because something needs to challenge Putinism because it's gone on for too long and um, and it doesn't bode well for the future if whoever succeeds Putin still believes the nonsense he's been pumping out. So it's something needs to change. 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, well, Matthew, Ed, thank you so much today. Where can listeners sort of find out more about you and your work at Rain? Yeah. So if you if you go to rainnetwork.com, that's Rain R A N E, you'll find everything related to our our, our company. Um, our 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 articles are still present on our our, our website called Stratfor. So that's stratfor.com. Um, and yes, I encourage anybody to, to subscribe and read to us. We offer, uh, our, our up to three articles a month for free. Uh, and then of course, if you, if you get a subscription, then you can read uh, all of our, our content on, on our website, um, that, that we publish. We have analysts covering the, the whole world who are writing on geopolitics, um, uh, in, in, in even countries that often escape the eye of the Western press. But mm. so I, I really think that it's a, it's a great value uh, for people who are interested in, in geopolitics and want to really get under the surface and get past kind of the, the surface level reporting that you would see in, in, in free media. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for joining us today. It's been great to have you on. Thanks, Chris. This is Secrets and Spies.